broadcast is now starting. All attending are in listen-only mode. Hi, this is Michael Walton, uh, Category Manager at Rigel Medical, and the webinar today will be a presentation on a defibrillator and transcutaneous piercing. So the agenda, or what we're going to be talking over today, we'll briefly go over some of the history of defibrillation and some theory some definition usage, um, some of your physiological aspects of the heart, a quick overview of the standard for defibrillator testing, um, a typical defibrillator uh, uh, PM, and uh, a conclusion. So as an introduction, <clears throat> the cardiac arrest happens when the heart is in an inefficient pump. So it kind of pump blood around the body, oxygenated blood, and get rid of the waste product, which is deoxygenated blood. Um, in the UK, an estimated 30,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests happen annually, um, almost 10 times as many in the, in the US. But sadly, the chances of surviving uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are 1 in 10. And uh, this only increases slightly if you have a cardiac, a cardiac arrest within a hospital or a healthcare um, premises. So unless there's some kind of immediate intervention from CPR uh, and defibrillation, you're pretty much going to have a really poor outcome. Um, and the survival rates drop um, 1% every, every uh, minute, so therefore without CPR, without defibrillation, an out-of-hospital out cardiac arrest has dire consequences, become hypoxic, and ultimately will lead to, uh, to death. Around about the, the turn of the, the 20th century, people um, were living longer, um, infectious diseases used to be the main um, leader of death globally and as people started to live slightly longer um, coronary heart disease became more apparent um, so to try and counter that I guess um, in the early 20th century Swiss uh, researchers um, Jean-Louis uh, Prevost and Frederick Batelli um, came across the paradox which you could put electrical current through the heart um, invasively and not only could it lead to fibrillation but it, more importantly in the purpose of this whole presentation and the medical device that is defibrillation. Defibrillation came about, again, this was um, first on, experimented on, on animals. Um, and then as the 20th century progressed, in the 20s, Karen Hoven um, in Baltimore started to work more with a um, cardiac surgeon, Claude Beck, and they were experimenting with open chest clinical defibrillation using uh, AC current. And so pictured there uh, is an open chest defibrillator, one of the very first open, um, well, that was the first defibrillator that was, that was used. Um, and they called this technique a counter shock. So Beck being the expert, in an improving heart circulation. Notice that when he would perform his cardiac surgery, um, the heart would go into ventricular fibrillation. Um, and in 1947, Beck applied open chest defibrillation to the human heart during um, ventricular fibrillation for the first time, successfully reviving the patient using the AC biophasic electric defibrillator. Meanwhile, over in um, Moscow, Gervich 
um, was experimenting with a less dangerous, in inverted commas, um, DC monophasic device that would deliver thoracic defibrillation, i.e. non-invasive. So it wasn't an invasive procedure, it wasn't open chest anymore. And um, they, they would discharge a capacitor at high voltages um, across the animal's chest to restore cardio function. History of defibrillation will continue with the 50s and the 60s because with just like everything um, in the 20th century there was big advances in technologies. Zoll, who you're probably familiar with that name, was a Boston cardiologist and he uh, he started experimenting with cardiac piercing and AC defibrillation. Um, Laun used DC cardio version, which is a smaller amount of energy that's delivered uh, across the heart. And then uh, Pleska, Pleska pretty much optimized Gervich's DC, uh, DC defibrillator and pretty much made it to the defibrillator that we see today um, from the 60s to the, to the 80s. Now, defibrillator is a pretty advanced, sophisticated um, medical devices that offer um, a number of options, um, including PACE, non-invasive piercing, um, SpO2, ECG, um, they're pretty much a patient monitor as well as a, as a defibrillator. Um, in the 90s, um, automatic external defibrillators were, or were pretty much a, a layman's device um, to give out-of-hospital cardiac uh, arrest patient, patients a better chance of survival. And we see them in every uh, other work and day of our life, supermarkets, um, shopping malls, um, work premises etc. So what is fibrillation? It's the uncontrolled or rapid contractions of the heart muscle. So it does, really doesn't know what it's doing, the, the, the heart. Um, atrial and ventricular fibrillations slightly different whereas aerial fibrillation is not immediately life-threatening because it can, it can lead to ventricular fibrillation. However, uh, initially you will, the heart will still function. Uh, oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood will be uh, pumped respectively to the to the to the to the um, your, your body and to your pulmonary uh, system. So, ventricular fibrillation. This is the severe. Um, condition which effectively stops the blood flow leading to a cardiac arrest leading to uh, death because you would lose unconsciousness um, being hypoxic and um, this results in a systole and we pretty much discussed the window frame in that if you're not if there's been no intervention within 10 minutes um, then you've pretty much had it, and it's a dire, a really dire outcome. Um, atrial fibrillation can be treated with um, drugs, heart rate, heart rate lowering drugs, or the cardio version, which is like a lower um, shock. Um, but what we'll talk about more, where atrial fibrillation and cardio version is important, is where we have cardiac cardio sync. Where you need to synchronize to the R wave to make sure you have um, an efficient mechanism for atrial fibrillation. Uh, ventricular fibrillation requires high energy and that pretty much resets the, the heart um, and we'll discuss that more during the presentation. So what is defibrillation? That's energy delivered across the heart or, or current specifically. Um, and the paddles on an external defibrillator are placed from the sternum to the apex. These are clearly identified on any defibrillator. Um, placement of the paddles can be anterior to anterior or anterior to uh, posterior.
So what are the myths with defibrillation? Um, a defibrillation defibrillator starts the heart. Well, clearly it doesn't. Um, and it's used in a, a systole or flatline scenario. So we've all seen the, the movies or films where a guy or girl has a, um, a flat line and the um, clinician or whoever is um, delivering a shock to bring this person back to life. Well, that is just a myth because if there's no electrical activity in the heart, then there's bringing the, the heart will never restart up by itself. So what the defibrillator does do, it briefly stops the heart if it's in a arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation and the heart will restart by itself. Um, but this is only possible if there's electric, electrical activity uh, in the myocardial uh, muscles, myocardia being the, uh, the muscle of the heart. What type of defibrillators do we have? Well, advanced life support, external defibrillators are pretty much an all-in-one solution. Pearson, vital sign monitoring, uh, diagnostic ECG, um, other functions like uh, breath rates, etc., etc. And these are comprehensive medical devices used by uh, emergency medical services personnel ambulance drivers uh, or A&E &E, um, because they're, they're an all-in-one solution uh, effectively whereas a basic life support um, an automatic external defibrillator can be operated by unskilled um, personnel has very basic functions it's just a, it'll just output current effectively but has algorithms to accurately evaluate the cardiac rhythms because that's pretty crucial, um, the, the, the evaluation of uh, the, a non-shockable and shockable rhythm. Um, so a, a external defibrillator, or automatic external defibrillator will only shock ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia when it's, um, when it's pulseless. So a little bit more about uh, defibrillation and some, some of the technologies. Earlier uh, type defibrillators um, are monophasic, um, which are less effective for a number of reasons. And we'll, we'll do a comparison between monophasic and biphasic and require high energies um, to um, dissipate the energy across the thoracic cavity, which is the chest. Biphasic, pretty much all modern defibrillators manufactured these days are um, a biphasic. Um, energy levels go from or can peak depending on technologies to 150, 200 joules, but some still go to um, 360 joules. Manufacturers have their own painted um, biphasic technologies. Um, the biphasic truncated exponential, um, the rectangular, rec rectilinear biphasic waveform, and a pulsed um, biphasic, which is pretty much your Phillips, your Zoll, and your um, Schiller. Monophasic versus biphasic. Well, monophasic is a dampened sine wave. Um, with a high peak current. So if we look at the, the, the two comparisons, uh, especially in a, a lower impedance, a, a monophasic will give much higher currents. Um, and the current flows one direction as opposed to two with biphasic. And as the body impedance increases, the heart may not receive enough current to defibrillate um, because of this high impedance. So if you were a bariatric patient, if you had a lot of mass, then this energy isn't going to be delivered across the heart. It's going to be, um, what's the word, attenuated because of the amount of mass that a, um, a big guy or um, somebody might have. So biphasic... Um, can adjust and maintain the delivered energy regardless of a patient's impedance. 
So the patient ha will have an equal chance of survival um, regardless of if the bariatric or if the, um, you know, the, these type of physiological um, masses. Lower energy can be delivered, um, so you're not using the amount of energy to get the same outcomes. And um, it has been, although not totally proven, when I did a little bit of research, that lower biphasic energy uh, may result in less damage to the myocardium. So what is exactly happening? How, what is being measured? What is being delivered? We kind of, um, within defibrillation, use the standard UI, uh, st standard um, unit SI, sorry, of energy, which is joules, um, dual coming from Manchester. The, the scientist who was from Manchester in the UK What's the relationship? Well, it's pretty much um, power. Um, so one watt for one second is, is one joule. And it's the relationship between voltage, current, resistance and time. Um, different defibrillators output uh, various different waveforms. So how do we measure this? How do we make sure that a defibrillator is fit for purpose? If I set uh, 200 joules on a defibrillator, how do I know that I'm going to measure 200 joules? Well, by a little bit of um, calculus, we, using the uh, integral of, or looking at the integral of the, the area you're under the curve. So um, the resistance across the thoracic cavity, if that's fixed within a um, defibrillator analyzer, then we can measure and monitor the current of voltage and then from that we can derive uh, the amount of energy in joules. Typical dosages, um, depending on the condition, the arrhythmia, biphasic and monophasic have different characteristics. Um, I just uh, won't talk about that much, I'm not a clinician, but I thought it was worthwhile there. Uh, to put that into the, the, the presentation. So a little bit more about the, the heart and what on earth's going on and why defibrillation is, uh, is required. So the electrical activity of the myocardium, this regulates the cardiac cycle. And the cardiac cycle is uh, the stimulus of the contraction, systole, uh, of the atria and followed by the contraction of the, the ventricles, uh, after which the ventric, after ventricular systole, which is a contraction, it'll relax uh, into a diastole, um, and the atrial opens up and blood will flow. So, effects, effectively, it's um, contraction and a rest period, contraction in a rest period, but works with the atria. Um, pumping then the ventricle uh, pumping um, in a sequential manner. Um, so right atrium returns deoxygenated blood from the upper and lower body uh, and that will go to the right ventricle. As the right ventricle contracts, um, the, the atrium contraction is more of a passive flow of blood the, the power horse, the real workhorse of the heart is the, the ventricles. So the right ventricle, when that contracts, it will pass deoxygenated blood. That will be passed to the, um, the, the pulmonary artery um, and to the lungs. The lungs perform a gas exchange, expelling the waste product, carbon dioxide, uh, from blood to air and taking the nutrient, oxygen, vital for, for cells, to live um, from air to blood. So the, the left atrium um, receives this oxygenated blood um, from the lungs via the pulmonary veins, pulmonary veins being the only vein that 
carries oxygenated blood, um, passes it through the AV valve to the left ventricle, and the left ventricle is the uh, is the real workhorse that contracts to deliver the much needed um, nutrient of oxygen and oxygenated blood to the upper and lower body and the rest of the peripherals um, via the aorta. We have a picture there of the cardiac cycle where we have the sinus node, uh, AV node, the common bundle, bundle branches, uh, Purkinje fibers, um, and I think it's a nice diagram and I'll tell you why I think it's nice because from the colour code you can pretty much assess um, P wave activity, um, the yaw wave activity and the T wave activity from the in relationship to the cardiac cycle and how the sinus node um, is the starter of the heart and then the Purkinje fibres um, and the bundle of hiss is the, the contraction of the ventricular muscle. Shockable arrhythmia. Why do we need to differentiate between uh, shockable arrhythmia and um, non-shockable arrhythmia? And why do we need to even um, synchronize with, why is there a synchronization um, option on a defibrillator? Well, hopefully I'll reveal why. The ventricular fibrillation, fine and coarse, is pretty much just uncontrolled, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much a sporadic signal if you were looking on an on a ECG machine. And effectively, as I've already alluded to in the presentation, you're going to die if you haven't got any type of intervention. If you do have, uh, still have an R wave present, um, then you would need to synchronize, or the defibrillator needs to synchronize to your R wave. If it doesn't, if there's, if you, you know, you're producing no blood flow around the body, if it is a sporadic delivery of, uh, or non-delivery of um, oxygenated blood, then you don't require any synchronization, but you do in conditions like atrial flutter, atrial um, fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia with a pulse because what the defib does is it will synchronize with the R wave and it has to deliver energy um, in a set period um, after the R wave for various reasons which I will discuss um, in the next couple of slides. Non-shockable arrhythmia is a systole um, where the P wave can still be present but it's pretty much a flat line and possible to try and um, stimulate the heart back into electrical activity. But this is with the use of CPR and drugs. Certainly isn't with the use of a, a defibrillator or any type of current. So cardiac synchronization, um, when the heart goes through depolarization and, and the repolarization process, it produces the what we, we see on the ECG, um, your normal sinus rhythm. And there's a, um, a picture of it. What, what is relevant and why synchronization is relevant is because um, when a pulse is present, um, defibrillation shouldn't really occur during the vulnerable period because you can go from having a relatively okay uh, arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation and you can send the heart into um, fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, if you were to deliver energy in the vulnerable period which is the T wave. So what we have there is what we call the absolute refractory period and relative refractory period where the absolute refractory period is the ventricle in um, depolarization where it's contracting and it's in its, um, it won't respond to any type of stimuli um, in its recovery period, which is repolarization. So if you were to have an aerial fibrillation and then send current to the heart in the, the 
the T wave, then that's going to have catastrophic uh, outcomes. So defibrillators must deliver, or typically deliver, um, after the R wave, anywhere from 10 to 30 milliseconds, up to, to, to 40 milliseconds. Well, there's 30, but it can be plus or minus, you know, um, 7 milliseconds, 8 milliseconds, that type of thing. But it mustn't deliver um, current in the, in the T wave. Um, so that's what the defibrillator does. It measures the R wave and then it makes sure that it delivers current um, accordingly. Transcutaneous piercing, what is that? That's applying a pulse, it's a pulse generator effectively. It's just a really crude pulse generator um, and that can be delivered non-invasively. Why do we need that? Typically for uh, bradycardic patients, which is um, a rest and rhythm, which might be less than 60 beats per minute. Um, and that's, you can set that up within the defibrillator to define what is um, your demand and non-demand modes. Because it's, if you're in a uh, bradycardic condition, you, you want to stimulate the, the myocardium, you want to get it um, up to a, a different rate or a t so you can effectively pump blood around the body. Um, so we have two modes, we have de demand and non-demand mode, which non-demand mode is fixed. So demand is very useful because it's again it synchronizes with the R wave and then it'll deliver, um, it'll try and deliver a suitable amount of um, pulses per minute accordingly to the physiological um, ECG measurements or the, the beats per minute of the heart. The fixed is pretty much just it does it, you fix it to a certain rate and it will it doesn't monitor the ECG it just pulses now that's slightly to as a clinician you would probably set that if you couldn't measure your vital signs you couldn't measure any um, ECG it's still effective it's still something that you can use but again you can if you deliver current even though it's a lower amount of current to the T wave, the vulnerable period, then you can you can cause a um, in fixed. It's not a desirable method of transcutaneous person. Placement of the pads that's anterior, anterior to posterior. Typical transcutaneous person, which transcutaneous person is not to be confused with transvenous person, which is four chambers of the heart and invasive a lot of the time. Typically on a defibrillator <coughs> you um, because it's not invasive you, you're pretty much um, just delivering a pulse from two outputs and that would be across the um, as I've discussed anterior uh, anterior anterior to posterior you can output up to 200 milliamps um, it has a pulse rates settings um, <coughs> Pulse width isn't typically um, selectable. Different manufacturers use different pulse widths. So the pulse width is pretty much uh, critical to make sure that you can stimulate. You are delivering a amount of energy to stimulate the myocardium. And then we have a refractory period where you're not um, delivering in a certain time frame, certain time interval. So the IEC standard, this is one of the things that um, with most medical devices, well, all medical devices, for them to be fit for purpose, for you to put a medical device or a manufacturer to put a medical device on the market, it needs to go through the medical uh, devices directive and it needs to adhere to some really pretty much um, basic safety and essential requirements um, and these requirements for defibrillation. I mean, the 60601 standards per se pretty much um, cover manufacturing needs um, and all of the R&D 
and it's best practice, best practice advice and adherence to make sure that um, there's harmonization. Um, so you've got, I mean, the standard itself st stipulates accuracy on defibrillator energy with various loads, uh, maximum delay times from the synchronized peak uh, R wave or QRS complex and to the peak uh, delivered energy, the differentiation, differentiation and identification of shockable and non-shockable arrhythmia, especially for automatic external defibrillators, and the accuracy of the, the Pearson um, pulse rate, the um, current and the duration. So what does a typical PM look like? Um, visual tests. Visual tests is not to be underestimated. 70% of all failure of medical devices is via uh, uh, the visual test. And then we would do an electrical safety test, or perhaps you would do it after your typical PM, but it's still part of the process. Um, electrical safety test, you would either test it to the manufacturer's um, specifications, i.e. 60601, even though 60601 is a type test. Some manufacturers might stipulate that, some healthcare practices uh, organizations, sorry, um, will have 60601. Typically, we at Rigel would like to um, push 62353 because that's the recurrent um, test and procedure for, for in service devices. Um, we, we, we wouldn't, I, I, I think, and we have various presentations on this, but um, 60601 is for manufacturing, 62353 uh, is for, for your general biomed or clinical engineer to use. And then we have NFP 99 in the United States, etc., which is pretty much a 62353 action. So, Follow up. first of all, follow up your internal process. After that, if you haven't got an internal process, use the manufacturer's guidance, both on safety testing and on a, a typical PM. Um, you might test the, um, the battery performance um, with battery analyzers, check alarms to make sure, because a lot of modern defibrillators have C, CPR instructions. Um, and then you have other alarms for, you know, um, set parameters, pretty much typical of what you would find in a, a patient monitor. Then ECG um, performance, you're looking at gains of the R-Wave, you're looking at um, BPM rate verification, critical for the purposes of um, all way of synchronization and piercing and then frequency responses because you want a, the relative notch filtering at 50 hertz or 60 hertz you want low pass filtering you want high pass filtering the band pass filtering characteristics of an ECG because you need to monitor these things if you need to correctly synchronize and do the, the cardio version which is critical we record the sync delay of um, the, the synchronization mode, we would measure the linearity of energy, any metrology actually, I mean, it doesn't matter what you're, you're measuring. Linearity is a property in metrology and measurement that's critical for all medical devices. And that's why we at Rigel produce test equipment that, um, that will enable biomeds and um, clinical engineers to make sure their device is fit for purpose. Then we have um, the stipulations like perhaps um, your max charge time. You, if you were gonna, in the real world, if your defibrillator is running from batteries, um, you, and you want to deliver multiple amounts of energy across a patient, well, you need to make sure that each amount or at least you have 10 um, at full energy and that will be delivered um, and the specification of the device isn't compromised 
So that's an important part of testing your 10th repetitive test. Also your charge time as well, because your charge time, you want to make sure that the capacitors or whatever circuits used in the defibrillator are charged within a timely manner, because time is of the essence as far as delivering uh, energy is concerned. And then we have pace output again, current linearity, um, pulse width, and um, pulses per minute. Some service manuals might want you to look at the waveform um, on an oscilloscope. Well, with our Unipulse 400, you don't need an oscilloscope. It'll show you the, the picture online, but I'm gonna do a demonstration of the, of the Unipulse after this presentation. You might have a, a paddle impedance check one thing I haven't discussed, and this is pretty much the guidance from 60601, um, is that you use uh, 50 ohms as your typical transthoracic impedance to deliver and verify the performance of a defibrillator analyzer. Your <coughs> um, defibrillator might have a printer as per patient monitoring, you want to check the speeds, you want to check the amplitude is, is correct. And then other vital signs like SpO2 and IBP, etc. One crucial thing in which I must stress, um, and we at Rigel take very seriously, is that uh, defibrillators uh, are really dangerous devices, you know. I mean, they're extremely hazardous, so precautions must be followed to ensure a, a device is uh, tested under safe conditions. Um, always ensure that all tests are carried out by com uh, competent, suitably trained individuals. Now, there is a story that I've heard in my, um, or at least my experience of traveling around hospitals in the UK that uh, a clinical engineer used a defibrillator to, or at least he wanted to, uh, pretty much, I think, how many clinical engineers used NIBP to check their blood pressure? I would say yes. I've used the NIBP monitor to check my blood pressure. It's like, you, you do that sometimes. Um, but you don't use a defibrillator <laughs> to make sure that it works. Well, some guy did, and he, I mean, I wouldn't name the hospital, I, I can't remember actually. But uh, some chap did, and he delivered energy on himself and ended up in intensive care for uh, a, a, a week or so, or even a month. Um, so what, whatever you do, Rigel, funnily enough, manufacture, um, <laughs> manufacture uh, an analyzer so you don't have to test these things on yourself. Joking aside, I mean, that's a, that, that is a story that I've heard, whether it's a myth or not, I, I'm not entirely sure, but, but there you go. So just to conclude, defibrillators play an important role in trying to uh, provide the necessary intervention um, paired up with uh, CPR procedures. Advancements in technology have given um, emergency medical staff, the, the tools to uh, ha pretty much deliver advanced life support um, and reducing the potential of fatal outcomes. And then we have automatic external defibrillators that are improving out of hospital cardiac outcomes, arrest outcomes, um, that can be found globally in, in most public places or layman's use. Defibrillators are hazardous, um, medical devices are certainly not without risk. Um, what, one thing I, I must point out that there has been a couple of stories with the automatic external defibrillators actually not being fit for purpose. Manufacturers, um, the batteries just haven't been able to deliver the amount of energy and, and that's a huge risk. You buy these things thinking that they're going to be fit for purpose. Well, clearly some automatic um, external defibrillators haven't been and there was a big um, recall recently, well, the last couple of years. So bear in mind, regular performance of any medical device, really not so much defibrillators and safety tests and provide, uh, you know, the, the means of improving patient safety, pretty much to meet the manufacturer's specif specifications. 
the accuracy of them and uh, so the fit or meet their intended purpose of use. So I am going to give you some information that you can ask some questions um, in your little chat box and I will pick them up via email because it's sometimes it's tricky to do uh, in a webinar scenario. Um, but we, the presentation that we have, you can download the, um, the guidance that has been written and it's pretty much a comprehensive overview of um, defibrillation, much more in depth than this presentation. So that's downloadable. Uh, if you just Google that or, or go to the, the rival website, we, we have a page for that. But if you want uh, a copy, just email the, the, the below email address and we'll uh, send you a PDF. Um, we do have physical uh, guidance on defibrillation too, so if you're ever at um, Medica or Arapalf or EBMA or other... Um, expos and events and some training events then we provide physical um, guidance for these two so I'm gonna almost finish the presentation but I'm gonna give a, a little bit of a demo on on the instrument itself um, one thing that I, I would like to do though is stress Facebook you know um, LinkedIn Twitter YouTube sign up for them because we, we do this type of thing all the time and I find it's very uh, very good social media in particular is easier for us to put out some news um, and keep up to date with many things happening in Rigel. So I've got a defibrillator here and I've got the Unipulse 400 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, some testing. So what I've got set up here is I've got the defibrillator outputs going across a 50 ohm load, which is your simulated patient thoracic cavity. I have got some ECG outputs. Um, I've got five leads connected, but you, you, the Unipulse 400 does accommodate um, 12 leads. And then I'm just going to go through. Uh, a little bit of a basic PM, not so much a, a, a full, fully fledged PM, just because of time constraints, etc. So if you uh, if you first turn the the Unipulse on, this is the main menu. Um, so if I was to, you can do all of your testing is manual, but you can save tests within the instrument. So I can start an asset. I'll just for this purpose, I'll just put a arbitrary number in. And then I put the make in, I put the model in, I can put the serial number in. Um, I'm not going to do that just for the purpose of this exercise. But I'll. So now what I've done is I've started the PM, I've started the asset, and all of the information and tests will be saved. And what you've got is a, a soft key approach, so you can um, do each test using various soft keys. So the first one is um, DFib just normal defib and it'll give you a warning to say make sure that you you um, defib into the correct inputs and not the pacer inputs because they have different wattage settings for resistance to do measurements and then it's fairly basic I've got the 200 joules selected I would do, I can typically do uh, I'll do a quick linearity check so I could start at one jewel, press charge, and then we have our reading on the screen there, and then I can save that. I can select a hundred. And I can save that. In fact, before I save it, what I'll do is I'll show you um, Bear in mind the, the, the mind ray in particular has an, an accuracy of plus or minus 15%. Um, so I'm allowed 85 joules and I'm allowed 115 joules. So that's, that's something to bear in mind when we're doing these readings. 
What you're presented with when you do deliver current is you have um, a waveform. This happens to be biphasic. And you have other parameters, energy, peak voltage, peak current, and the, the time it's taken for the energy to be delivered. So we can save that. And then we can do um, 360. And then we have a reading now. Uh, um, again, uh, that's still suitable. That's still within specification um, for this device. We can save that reading. So we want is that's that would be a typical um, linearity check to make sure that you've got um, the the right amount of um, current delivered. But what also you might want to check is the is the timing of the charge. So I press the charge and the time button at the same time. And then it shows me the time it's take for the for the uh, capacitors to charge up and be discharged. And that's something that might be useful and not typically part of a PM but it could be part of um, a PM could be part of the manufacturing process. And then we have our sync, so we have to end, end a sync mode. <coughs> so now we synchronize to the R wave, you can see the sync there. Um, and what we're gonna measure is the time it takes for the defib to output the energy after the R wave. Um, so I'm just gonna press charge. And then we've got a reading there of 31 milliseconds. It also still gives you the energy delivered, etc. So we can save that. And I'm pretty satisfied now with, um, with the defibrillator side. Now I'm going to check the ECG, uh, ECG the um, automatic external defibrillator. Analyzing now. Do not touch patient. Actually, I should start that again. When you go into AED mode, Analyzing now. Do the, not touch the first patient. thing that you have is a um, it'll output a ventricular fibrillation. Shock advised. And then it'll charging. Tell Do you not touch patient. Shock delivered. So effectively, what's what's happening there is that we are delivering um, the, the energy because we're in a the, a shockable rhythm has been. Um, has been found. That's a, an essential part of um, testing a, an automatic external defibrillator. So I will save that. But then what also what I want to do is put a normal sinus rhythm, and then we'll we'll analyze that. Analyzing now. Do not touch patient. So we're just checking the algorithm to make sure that there is, and what you can do is you can just say pass um, non-shockable. So we, it gives you the facility to enter details on the screen to save all of this, and all of this information can be output as a, a CSV file, which is pretty good. So now we finish with our automatic external defibrillator. We can look at the, some patient monitoring, and the, the patient monitoring is a is a typical check where you can select a normal sinus rhythm, but you, we can change the amplitude that um, we can change the pulses per minute. <coughs> we can also introduce noise. So if I introduce noise, if you have a look at the patient monitor, I can increase the noise on there, and we've still got a flat line because the 
notch filtering for 50 hertz is good on this patient monitor. It's, <coughs> it's, it's doing its job. But if I change that to 50 hertz, uh, 60 hertz, then you'll see there's a lot of noise there. So this is set up for um, to get rid of all of that unwanted um, electrical noise that you might have in typical um, situations. So we can do all of the tests that you would, could do with any patient monitor. We could have ventricular and atrial arrhythmias. We can simulate a pacer being fit. And we also have um, sine waves, square waves, triangle waves, etc. to check the response of your um, of your patient monitor and then we can save that and say past, etc. So you would, whatever test you would want to do, like I said, I'm not gonna go into a full PM for the nature of this exercise. And then the last but not least, we have Pearson. So what we have with the Pearson, I just wanna, why is that? With a person I can set different technologies and then what, I'm, what I can do is I can select the load. For the purpose of this exercise I'm going to just use the uh, defib load. But I can use the person, you, if you have a look at the, 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 the bottom there, there is um, person and there's also defib inputs. The person, because sometimes transcutaneous person manufacturers might ask for various loads, different loads, um, but I'm going to use the defib inputs which is convenient and actually Mindra and this Benny Hart ask for 50 ohms so that's convenient. So once I'm satisfied with that, I will put out a, um, a normal sinus rhythm, I can pretty much set all the characteristics on that normal sinus rhythm. And then I will select on the pacemaker. I've got the pacemaker set up for 60 and I'm measuring 60. And I'm just gonna, 30 milliamps is enough to put out just for the purpose of this exercise. So I'm in demand mode. So what I'll start to see is I'll start to see the pulse. It sees 60 uh, uh, pulses per minute. So we're measuring the 60 pulses per, per minute from the device. We're measuring the pulse width which we can also view. And then we can measure peak current, average current, um, lead current, trail current, because some transcutaneous Pearson um, options have different um, attributes. You, you, there might not be a perfect square wave, the amount of energy that's being delivered, it might be a, um, the area under the curve, so to speak. So peak current can be measured. This one is set at 30 milliamps, and then we can measure the, um, the amount of energy that's being delivered. What we can also do, because this is in, in demand mode, now if I increase my heart rate, then the defib, uh, sorry, the Pearson will stop, stop Pearson. The reason for that um, is because you don't want, the, the pacemaker has already realized that we are, um, we, 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 I'm not in a bradycardic condition anymore. I don't need, I don't need to be, uh, the pacer doesn't need to work. Um, but we can put it in a condition, uh, sorry, you can't say that. We can put it in a condition of back in a, a bradycardic condition and then you'll see it start pacing again. And then we can select that and save all of those parameters. We also have some parameters for rack refractory period, um, sensitivity, and um, some more noise immunity levels. So that's uh, your, your typical um, PM. Once I'm satisfied with the end of that, I just press end asset, and then all of that information is, is uh, saved. And then I can go through each test, and all of this can be downloaded as a CSV file. So that, that that's the the handy 
way, an intuitive way of saving any type of results. Um, I'll just see if I've got any questions here. Right, let's have a look. There is, I've got a question about the paddles. Yes, we have a paddle adapter that comes free of charge with the Unipulse 400. Um, so, although I've got four, four um, mill connectors going into the device, we do accommodate paddles too. There's an adapter where, and it's the same size as the actual device itself. I mean, the, the weight and the size of this thing is probably, um, although a little biased, the most comprehensive on the market. It's very light. It's designed for field service, but it also uh, quite can um, can sit on a on a desk or a bench um, quite conveniently. So there's a there's a few things where um, it has many um, features that are attractive for field service and for biomed. But if anyone has any more questions. Um, on the Unipulse, just fire over an email. I'll put the question in this box and then I'll get back to you via email. Um, okay, well, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. What we'll do is we'll put out, if anyone wants the slides, email us, or um, the video will probably be on YouTube sometime, I'd imagine. Um, so, yeah we can um we'll put that up and then you can watch it anytime you want anyway so thank you everybody for attending the, the webinar and i will see you soon thank you